All right, so we're going to get right into the uh, first session. Um, we, uh, and the session will be followed by uh, a break. And just so that you know, there is uh, tables with books and uh, DVDs and other products available in the dining area for, your, uh, uh, for you to look at and to, to acquire during the break times. And so that will be available for you there, and feel free to check that out. And uh, there will be also food available throughout the day, and we'll talk about that a little bit more after this session. But our first speaker this morning is John Feeks. He comes from Winnipeg, Manitoba. He's the pastor of the New Life Sanctuary Church. Did I get that right? And uh, so he will be sharing with us our first session this morning, and uh, this session is titled The Redeemer's Authority, and so uh, please make welcome John Feeks. Wow. I'm okay. You're okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning, everyone, and God bless you all. I understand I have 45 minutes, so I'm going to use them. Hopefully I use them wisely. So friends, my heart is just um, overflowing and overwhelmed. I'm, very, I'm just so happy and joyful and grateful to God that under his providential care, we can do this again. And uh, you, I think you and I both could agree that if wicked man had his way, we wouldn't be here. But God knows how to apprehend wicked men and make them do what he says. <laughs> and so here we are. And um, so just by way of introduction here, I'm going to leave that slide up. I asked the, the men in the sound booth to please just leave that slide up. Those are some uh, helpful resources for you. The Shepherd's Voice with Pastor John Feeks. That's my YouTube channel. And I try to load on that channel just about everything I've ever done. There's a few things to go up yet. And then... Uh, if you're interested, you can come to my website. It's uh, careofwinnipeg.org, Care, Care Ministries of Winnipeg. I don't have our church website up there because it's undergoing revision right now. But uh, that's New Life Sanctuary Church, and we're working very hard at the website. And I'll just let you know that I wrote two little booklets here. One is called Bible Basics. The other one's called Creation Basics. Very short, very sweet, just the, the very... Um, uh, basic Bible teachings, things that I, I think are essential, that Christians should know, new believers should know. Font 14, very big, <laughs> very easy to read, and the price is right, they're free. So they're on one of the tables out there. Uh, feel free to take one, give, uh, give it to somebody who is maybe exploring the Christian faith. They're not really sure what it is we believe. I think these would be very helpful. And uh, so take them and use them, and when I run out, we'll, we'll just make some more. How's that sound? Sounds pretty good, huh? Okay. Well, friends, uh, today we, I kind of zeroed in on that word redemption. That was, our, um, that was our conference theme. Look up, your redemption draweth nigh. That's the, that's the theme of the conference, isn't it? And so when I was introduced to the conference theme, I kind of zeroed in on the word redemption. And from there I looked to the Redeemer himself, to Jesus. He's our Redeemer. He's the one who loved us first. And I thought, you know, I think every one of my lectures today and into the weekend are going to be zeroing in on Jesus. Because as far as I'm concerned, the Lord Jesus, Lamb of God, crucified and resurrected, puts everything else into the shadows by comparison. So I thought, hey, you know what? We should look at him. So... To get a running start at this, because he's the answer to all of our problems, isn't he? Well, I'd like to zero in on a big problem that Jesus solves for us. And the big problem, friends, the most serious problem that I can see, is not climate change. Are you shocked? <laughs> it's not global warming. <laughs> and it's not COVID either, or any of its alleged variants. It's not Russia. It's not North Korea. It's not rising gas prices or inflation or anything else like that. I think, really, in the present age, the biggest problem humans face is a little something, something called deception. Lies, deception, misdirection, deceit. It's everywhere. It has supersaturated the world. 
And you and I know that uh, lying and dishonesty and broken promises, that's just par for the course when you're in the political sphere, the political arena. Uh, politicians lie to us all the time. hope you're not too shocked by this. <laughs> and this has been a big problem for a long time, hasn't it? They lie, they cheat, they break their promises, they flip-flop on social political issues. We're sort of not shocked anymore when this happens. There will be no vaccine mandates, we heard. And a couple weeks later, vaccine mandates or something. Uh, Biden said, we're, we're, no, we're never going to abandon American soldiers in Afghanistan. And he abandoned hundreds of them. And on and on it goes. And, and our own guy up here has broken enough promises. Well, that's not a shock, but what might be a shock to us is that the media, the news outlets, there was a time when the news reporters, the media outlets, would hold truth to power. Do you remember those days? It didn't matter who was in office. You could be a liberal or a conservative. It didn't matter. The reporters are coming to get you. <laughs> They're going to ask you hard questions. They're going to check you out. They would hold truth to power in that way. Well, that's, that's long gone. And now you've got CNN and MSNBC and you've got Global and CBC and they're all what? They're all propagandists now for our left-leaning governments. They're in the pocket of the governments. They're bought and paid for. There used to be a time when the, the politician would stand at a podium like this and the press would be there nailing him with questions. They're not doing that. Now they're turned the other way and they're facing the public and they've become the megaphone for our left-leaning political leaders. And if that weren't enough, you've got big tech and their social media platforms all pumping the same propaganda, the same line, the same narrative. And don't you dare speak against it or that's it, you, you are cut off and you can't talk anymore. And maybe you've seen this kind of censorship in our world becoming very common. And sports and entertainment has fallen in line. Now sports athletes are propagandists and uh, movies are pumping the left-leaning propaganda, the whole narrative. It's, I mean, it's just on and on it goes. And that's a bit shocking to us. But to me, the biggest shock of all is what's happened to the scientific community. The scientific community was supposed to be objective. They are supposed to be engaged in a no-holds-barred search for truth. They were supposed to be apolitical. Not anymore. And that's a shock. I'm reading now from a, it's a 2009 Science Daily article. It said that 2% of the scientists that were interviewed admitted to falsifying data, maybe to get research grants or something, or to get famous or something. 34% of the scientists re, uh, surveyed admitted to other questionable research practices like not presenting data that conflicted with their views or dropping observation and data points based on gut feelings. In 2012, there was an article came out by the Association for Psychological Science, and the article was entitled, Questionable Research Practices Surprisingly Common. Half the scientists that were studied admitted to reporting only the experiments that gave desired results, and 1.7 admitted to outright faking or falsifying data. That's coming out of the scientific community. In a more recent British uh, Medical Journal article, it said that 13% of the scientists studied there admitted to falsifying or faking their data, and more than 1 in 10 scientists and doctors claimed to have witnesses, colleagues, deliberately falsifying data. We have a big problem now because uh, the scientific community has become a new priesthood, you see? If you have a, a, a panel of experts up here and they're, they're going to speak to some kind of social political issue, some kind of problem, who are we likely to listen to? Are we going to listen to some pastor? Or are we going to listen to some scientist in a lab coat with a clipboard? Of course, we're going to listen to him, of course, because he, uh, he, he has an inside track on the truth. The scientist does. Now we're discovering this is not so. Corruption has made its way into the scientific community. The scientific community has prostituted itself now. It will give whatever results the highest bidder is willing to pay. What do you want to hear? And we've seen that, haven't we? In the last two years, we've seen this. Well, we really shouldn't be so shocked. 
The Bible looked ahead to these days. In 2 Timothy 3.13, we were told that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And John, the beloved disciple, told us in the fifth chapter of his first epistle that the whole world lieth in wickedness. Literally, the whole world lies in the sway of the wicked one, and that's Satan, and he's the father of lies. And that's his biggest weapon against humankind. It's lies and deception. And that's our biggest problem as human beings. This is our big problem. Why? Because a right relationship with the holy God of heaven absolutely demands that you know some things. You have to know something. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't need an earned degree. You don't need a PhD or something. But God says you need to know some things and believe some things and do some things with that which you know. That's important. You remember Hosea 4, 6. I think you know that verse. My people are destroyed, says the Lord, for lack of knowledge. God expects us to know some things. And you remember the great apostle Paul, uh, with a very heavy heart, he was writing concerning his countrymen, the Jews. He said, I bear them record, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And that was enough to send them on a trajectory to hell. Well, friends, you, we've got to ask the question here this morning. How can anyone know anything in a world that is, that is this covered in darkness? In a world that is this supersaturated with deception, how can anyone know anything? In fact, the Bible says every man at his best state is a vapor. We are limited. We are uh, people who lack wisdom and insight and we're error prone uh, friends, we are in desperate need around here. All of us, humankind in general, is in desperate need. What we are in need of is a competent authority who is qualitatively greater and infinitely greater than all of us put together, the one who has the supreme right to be believed and obeyed, one who is wholly reliable and trustworthy, whose word is infallible and inerrant. Uh, we need this one to talk to us to help us interpret things properly, to give us the truth so we can make good and right choices. And of course, this competent authority is God. You know that. He's, it's God. It's the holy God of heaven. It's the king of eternity. We need to hear from God and from his living word, Jesus, revealed to us as he is in the pages of the Old and New Testaments. The Bible. We need the Bible. It is the light that shines in a dark place, isn't it? And I want to say this morning, friends, the Bible is not just helpful. <laughs> the Bible is a rational necessity. I don't think we, we know how to reason up, down, or sideways without the Bible, without God's special revelation, the Bible. Without the Bible, we're disasters. We're groping in the darkness. And we're without hope in this world. We need God's special revelation. And I mean it. This is not hyperbole. I mean this. I measure my words on this. The Bible says in Colossians 2, 3, that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid in Christ. Do you believe that? Are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hid in Christ? If they are, we need to go to him to get some knowledge and to get some wisdom. If we don't, we'll be groping in the darkness like the unregenerate world out there. And uh, to really punch the point home here, I'd like us to go to the Gospel of John this morning, the Gospel of John chapter 8. We want to look at this amazing encounter that Jesus had with the religious leaders of his day. And we're going to learn a little something about God and his authority and his self-authenticating word, which needs no footnotes, no footnotes in the Bible. God doesn't need anyone to help back him up when he makes a truth claim. God speaks on his own authority. His Bible carries its own credentials. It is that which is most reliable. You know, friends, we don't test the Bible. You don't check the Bible to see if it's reliable. You use the Bible to check other things to see if those things are reliable. This is the standard here. This is the plumb line. It doesn't get any more solid or dependable than this. The Bible. God's word. Well, let's, let's look at this exchange here. John 8 and verse 12. This is Jesus now speaking to his uh, religious antagonists of his day. John 8, 12. Then Jesus speaks. Uh, again, uh, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Well, 
there you have it on the authority of the Son of God himself. He said, the whole world is in darkness. Uh, yes, there's moral evil here, that's, that's for sure. But more fundamentally, friends, the truth is hidden from the eyes of fallen men. And I want to say this morning that autonomous human effort, human reason without any reference to God is just slated for disaster. It's going to get you nowhere. Uh, truth is inaccessible by unaided human reason, autonomous human reason. It just leads to utter foolishness and wrong conclusions. This is a huge problem. This is a serious problem, friends, because uh, darkness and ignorance is not just a nuisance. It's deadly. It's dangerous. The darkness conceals the, where the threats and the deadly dangers are. We can wander into disaster if we don't have light. See? And it hides the places where the blessings reside. We need light to come in. We need divine light to come into this world and enlighten our hearts and minds so that we know the truth, so that we don't wander into disaster and error and make terrible choices. We need to know where the blessings are. We need to know where the good works are that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Because I want a crown. I want some crowns when I go to heaven. Why? Because I want to throw them at Jesus' feet. And you, we don't want to be people standing there without something to offer Jesus. <laughs> That's the whole point of receiving those crowns. So you have something with which to honor the Lord that loved you first and purchased you with his own precious blood. And that's what this is really all about here. This is what this whole conference is about or should be about. The Lord Jesus Christ receiving the rewards of his sufferings. And Jesus says it here on his own authority. He is the light of the world. There is no other. He is the way, the truth. He is the life. He is the only source of truth, all truth worth knowing. Jesus said it in John 6, 63. My, my words are spirit and they are life. The words, the opinions... The pontifications of unregenerate fallen men are worthless. In fact, they're less than worthless. They'll lead you into disaster. Is that heavy-handed? Is that hard? I'm sorry if that's offensive, but this is the picture here. This is the picture that's being painted for us in the Holy Bible. Now, look at, I mean, predictably, this is how his antagonists have chosen to respond. Verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Oh, where are they getting that from? Well, of course, they claim to believe and obey the Mosaic law. And the, under the Mosaic law, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every matter is established. So this charge against Jesus would be legitimate if he were merely human. Now, Jesus Christ, of course, is human. He's as human as we are. He was uh, human from the moment of incarnation, and he is still a human. He's a human male, slated to return and to judge the world in righteousness. But friends, he's not merely human. He took a human nature at incarnation, but his divine nature he's had from all eternity, and he will have into eternity. He is very God of very God, and so he can speak on his own authority. Right? Look at John uh, 8.14 now. John 8.14. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but you cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. He is of a, he is of a different order of being than we are also. Uh, he is the God of heaven. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the one to whom all authority has been given. And when he speaks, his word carries its own credentials. He doesn't need any help. He doesn't need to be backed up. Jesus never said, uh, now gentlemen, if you just consult uh, Plato on this, you'll see that he agrees with me. Or Aristotle, or some philosopher or something. Uh, you'll see that what I'm saying uh, matches what brilliant scientists are saying. No, he never talked like that. Jesus said uh, amazing things. He declared amazing things concerning himself and his redemptive work and his father and the future and uh, his moral prescriptions for man, and he did so on his own authority. Thank you. He does not, and his word is unchanging. It will never need to be revised, amended, adjusted to keep up with modern opinion on things. No. His word is forever settled in the heavens. Thank you. That's, that's, that's all we need. In fact, 
his chief spokesman of the apostles, Peter, said that we have been granted all things that pertain to life and godliness, and that is long before the advent of modern psychology. You have a wonderful counselor, and his name is Jesus, who has been touched with the feeling of your infirmities and has sympathy, and you can talk to him, and he understands. And he can make the changes in you and in me that need to be made, and he will make those changes. There's only one thing that's needful. Mary found it at his feet, remember? Only one thing is needful. Mary has found it, and it will not be taken from her. Have you found it, friends? In Jesus, it won't be taken from you. There's only one thing needful, and it's him. Verse 15, Jesus continues, You judge after the flesh, I judge no man. Well, that's an important passage there. These Pharisees are busy judging people on outward appearance. Oh, look at that guy. He didn't wash his hands before he ate. What a sinner. <laughs> he doesn't believe exactly the way I believe. Or look how he, look how he walks. Look how he talks. He must have sin in his life or whatever. They, people are judging on outward appearance. Jesus said, I don't do that. I judge with righteous judgment. In fact, Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world the way you gentlemen seem to be doing. Jesus said, I came into the world that the world through me might be saved. Jesus came on a rescue mission for humanity. Not at all what these Pharisees were expecting. John 8, 16, And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. Friends, all true judgment in this world must be in accordance with the Father's opinion on things. God interprets every last single speck of reality and he gives all things an identity as they relate to his plan. He is the pre-interpreter of the world. He is the capital K knower of all things. We're just derivative, small k knowers. God enlightens the mind of man. If you know something, it's because your belief maps on to God's interpretation of the world. And if your, if your interpretation doesn't match, map on to God's interpretation, well, then you're wrong. That's very politically incorrect to talk like that, but that's how it is. And, of course, Jesus and his Father are one. The Lord Jesus agrees with his Father on all things. And you and I today have a complete Bible. And Peter told us that we should know something, knowing this. No, not, not hoping, wishing, or suspecting. Know this, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. That means that this Bible is God's interpretation of the world we live in. It's his interpretation of all things. And if you want to regard the world correctly or your experiences correctly, then you've got to do it through the lens of the scriptures or you're going to get it wrong. And getting it wrong can be deadly. If you get it very wrong, it can lead you on a trajectory to hell if you don't regard Jesus correctly as the Bible presents him. These are very serious matters here that we're discussing, you see? Now look, please, at John 8, uh, 23. We're going to drop down to 23. Listen to Jesus now. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you, uh, if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. You mean there's only one avenue to a right relationship with God? Yes. And it's Jesus Christ. It's God manifest in the flesh in the person of his beloved son. That's it. He is the message and the messenger. He is the goal and the direction. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the reason for everything that's ever been created or everything that ever will be. Christ the Lord. And our eternal destinies, friends, rest solely on how we regard and respond to Jesus. That's it. And that is very narrow. That's narrow. That is very exclusivist language. That is not politically correct. But this is what God has said. And can I say this, friends? God is very shocking, isn't he? God is surprising. Uh, we say that God is sovereign. Is God sovereign? Yes, God is sovereign. And you know what? God will have to tell us what that means. You don't say, well, I believe God is sovereign, therefore he must operate like this. No, you won't talk like that. God will tell you. I am sovereign. God is the king of the world, the king who inhabits eternity. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. 
And he'll tell you how he exercises that authority. He'll tell you what his plans are in the Bible. Nobody but nobody, using autonomous, unaided human reason without reference to God, could have ever figured out that we were in serious trouble with our sin debts and our sin natures and that we were on a trajectory for hell and that the remedy to this horrible problem was the Son of God crucified and resurrected. Nobody would have figured that out. That's very surprising. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it's foolishness. But this is the wisdom of God manifest in spectacular fashion in the gospel of his beloved Son. And we believed it. With divine persuasion, you and I believed it to the saving of our souls. Now we have the greatest message the world's ever heard to share with others. See? Now listen to this. John 8.30. Just drop down, please, to 8.30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then, he, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. We have to make a very, very careful, precise distinction here. It doesn't appear in our English translation here before us, but it is there in the Greek, and you can check me out on this. I believe in the Textus Receptus, the received text. I think that's the one we should be using. It's the one the King James Bible is translated from. Nevertheless, the King James has lost precision on this. Because in verse 30, Jesus spoke his words to many Uh, and many believed on him or believed in him. That's correct. Jesus spoke and people believed in him and they trusted in him for salvation. But the very next verse, verse 31, then Jesus turned his attention to those Jews which believed him. The word on is not there in the Greek. And there's a distinction being made here. It's subtle, but it's important. There is a real difference between believing somebody and believing in somebody. That is a very, very subtle but important difference. Verse 30 speaks of those who believed on Jesus. They trusted in him for salvation. Verse 31 and following, Jesus is addressing Jews who simply believe him. They are not believing in him yet for salvation. And you know this is true because as you read the chapter, he has very hard things to say to these people. They can't possibly be saved. What an enormous difference. You can believe everything Jesus said You could believe it as true, and you can still end up in hell. Why? Because you didn't receive him for salvation. You didn't trust in him. And that's a big difference. My son, Samuel, is a pilot. Uh, We're very proud of him. He, He worked very hard, and he got his wings. We were there when he got his wings. Wonderful. And the pilots have a tradition. Maybe there are some pilots here today. Uh, Your first passenger is your mom at least in this school. So uh, he took my wife up for a flight, took her around the city, brought the plane down safely. Praise the Lord. Okay, I, I believe that my son can fly an airplane. I watched him do it. I believe that he can do it. But I have not yet believed in him. I've not yet gotten on that plane with him and trusted in him to take me around the city and land me safely. But my wife, she has trusted in him. She believed in him. Enormous difference, isn't there? Jesus Christ would have you believe in him, trust in him, turn your life over to him. That is very different than simply believing a few propositions that you heard him say. That will not do you a bit of good, friends. And I believe with all my heart and on the last day of the conference, on the last lecture out of my mouth, if the Lord tarries, and I'm still here, I want to talk about the Redeemer's love. Because I'm absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ came into this world on a rescue mission to make this world savable. He offers salvation to the world. God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten Son. The Father sent the Son to be Savior of the world. And God demonstrated his love and that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. He made the world savable. He has provided salvation to every man, woman, and child on this planet, friends, but it won't do you a bit of good if you don't appropriate it. The gift is there. You need to receive it. You need to appropriate the saving benefits of what Jesus did, and you do that by placing your faith and trust in Christ. You come into a love-trust relationship with the Son of God, And then you'll experience forgiveness of sins, cleansing, and the new birth. 
and a whole new perspective on things, a new mind, a new attitude, new priorities, a new life trajectory with a guaranteed home in that beautiful place that Jesus has gone to prepare for those who love and trust him. See? This is a very important distinction here. Look, please, at verse 32 now. Just drop down to 32. Jesus said this, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How, sayest thou, you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whoever commit, committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Friends, our great enemy, our adversary, the one called Abaddon and Apollyon, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, the accuser, name, give him any name you want, his greatest weapon is lies and deception. He's the father of lies. And he uses lies in deception to hold people in seemingly bitter and hopeless bondage. That's what Satan does. He's got lies that bind people. And he has a favorite tactic he likes to use. He likes to mobilize human governments. Did you notice that? In the history of the church, human government has been our chief adversary. The Western world has had a little reprieve. It's very odd, actually. Christianity, real Christianity, authentic Christianity, has always been a persecuted minority. We've had a little reprieve. We got a little taste of it. A little taste of persecution just came up against it a little bit in the last two years. But Satan likes to use human government to enslave people to fear. Have you ever noticed? If it isn't one boogeyman, it's another. In the news, it's always something to keep you terrified. Why? Because fearful people are easy to control. The government, the left-leaning government, has an agenda, and we don't fit into the agenda. You see, we believe the Bible, and the Bible says we're supposed to be discerning people. We're supposed to be people who work hard. Uh, we earn our keep. We earn our bread. We check out truth claims. We're supposed to be free and responsible people. That's what we want to be. That's what the Bible says. Uh, and left-leaning government says, oh, no, you just be silent. Uh, you just stand in the bread line and we'll give you your bread. You don't, we don't want you free or responsible. You just listen to the government. You don't be discerning. You listen to everything we tell you. And we are in head-on collision with that kind of philosophy there. And the government wants to keep people in a deadly grip of fear to control people. That's what they've done for, for centuries. Well, we're not, feel, we're not fearful people. <laughs> uh, Jesus came into the world to free us from the bondage of fear of death. And what did Hebrews 2.14 tell you? It says that we have partaken of flesh and blood. We're human beings, embodied interactive agents. Well, the Son of God has partaken of the same. Why? That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That's the devil. And to release us who all our lifetime were held in bondage to the fear of death. And now we don't have that spirit anymore, us who have come into the love-trust relationship with Jesus. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Hey, we have a love relationship now with the King of Eternity. It's not just some kind of king-subject relationship either. Now we're adopted into the family of God, the household of faith. He's our Father. We call him Abba. Jesus Christ, our elder brother, and we're joint heirs with him of all things. Uh, what do we need to be afraid of? Nothing. <laughs> the righteous are as bold as lions, the Bible says. We don't, the fear of death has been mankind's most graded and, uh, greatest and feared enemy, fear of death. And now for us who love Jesus, death is nothing to be feared. It's a thin little vestibule into the place that he's gone to prepare for us. In fact, Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul said to those Philippian believers in the first chapter of his amazing epistle, he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he said, I have a desire, a strong desire, friends, to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. 
He said, but it's more needful for me to continue in the flesh. That's because it's helpful for you guys. Remember Paul said that to those Philippians? I really want to leave this earth and be with Jesus, but it's helpful to you if I stay for a while and minister here. And by the way, friends, that is a subtle little teaching there that's very important. And it's this. Don't bother praying to dead people. They can't help you. Praying to dead saints, waste of time. And I'm sorry, if there are Catholics here, I'm sorry if that's offensive. I, I'm just directing you to the only mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And the psalmist said, I have none in heaven but you. Pray to him. He sympathizes. He has power. He has mercy. He's the only one who can help us, really. When a man's gone, he's gone. He's going to have nothing more to do with anything that happens under the sun. Okay? Until the Lord returns and establishes his kingdom, and then we will reign and rule with Christ as kings and priests on the earth. Now, that's amazing, too. We're going to be speaking about those things later on. But, uh, friends, you and I, we've been redeemed from the fear of death. We're not afraid of death anymore. Uh, we've been redeemed from darkness and confusion and hopeless ignorance. We've been redeemed from all that, too. And we kind of see the world as it really is now. Aren't things coming into focus for you as you read the Bible? Hey, what about this Mark of the Beast stuff you read in Revelation 13? What, I wonder what that could be. People puzzled over this for centuries. I think we know now, or we have a pretty good idea. <laughs> the Antichrist, of course, he's uh, not omniscient and he's not all-powerful, and he's going to have to use technology to keep track of people and to control them. He's going to end up putting some kind of chip or something in people's, in people's bodies so they can buy and sell. Hey, the Bible prophesied this 2,000 years ago. By the way, there's already a pilot program in operation in Texas. With the wipe, a swipe of your hand over the scanner, you can purchase your groceries now. And this is the greatest thing. People think this is so wonderful. This is going to stop identity theft and all the rest of it. We'll be able to keep track of prisoners. If they uh, end up escaping, we'll have them chipped. Or missing children. Or hikers out in the wilderness. We'll, we'll, we'll know where they are now. We can, get, we can make sure everybody's chipped. And we'll have them uh, connected to the GPS. Wonderful. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> well, not so much if the bad guys are in power. <laughs> And the Bible prophesied all this 2,000 years ago. We sort of see the world as it is. We see various lusts and temptations, too, for what they are, these things that war against the soul. We're not drawn to that garbage anymore, these evil, wicked, filthy things that the rest of the world is drawn to. We kind of see them for what they are, soul-destroying things, things that estrange us from God, break, uh, break fellowship with God, uh, we say, no, thank you. The world drinks iniquity like water. We say, no, thank you. Not thirsty for that. <laughs> I'll drink living water, thank you very much. <laughs> and we know the truth, dear friends, that nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified, resurrected, and his tender ministry in our lives can really satisfy us. Nothing else will do. And we believe with the Apostle Paul, Colossians 2.10, that we are complete in him. We are complete in Jesus. No need to look any further. In fact, don't bother. He has done it all. And your salvation and mine too is not dependent, not one little bit, on our performance. It all hinges on his flawless performance. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And old things have passed away and all things are become new. Isn't this the greatest message you've ever heard? There's a little something called familiarity breeds contempt. I really hope that we never, ever grow contemptuous of these precious, priceless Bible truths that God has entrusted to us. Friends, in closing, I want to say that attempting to make sense out of this world and make sense out of our experiences autonomously, without any reference to God, is nothing but an exercise in futility. If we're not looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and getting his opinions on things, all of our research, no matter how well intended, is doomed to disaster. You just will not get at the truth. We need him to help us. We need to look to Jesus, the one who has redeemed us out of darkness, 
the one who has enlightened our minds and given us new hearts and a new understanding, new appetites and new priorities in this life. We need to constantly look to him. I like what Pastor Jeremy read uh, from the sacred scriptures. He said, as you have received Jesus, so walk ye in him. Do you remember the day you were converted? Nothing else mattered on this earth but Jesus Christ. Isn't that true? Didn't he outshine everything? Didn't he put everything else into the shadows by comparison? And Paul says, the way you received him right there, keep that up. Don't deviate. Don't start listening to the godless, unregenerate opinions of fallen man. Totally depraved. Uh, these people, they don't have a clue. The scientists have prostituted themselves. The philosophers don't know what they're talking about. The counselors are ignorant. The, the world, the, the darkness is deepening, friends. And there is a source of truth. It's God Almighty and his self-disclosure in the person of Jesus Christ as revealed to us in the pages of the Old and New Testaments. And this holy deposit has been granted to us, just normal people like us, just simple people. God says, you are the custodians of my life-giving gospel. God says, I'm not giving it to angels. Why not? Because they don't know Jesus Christ in a redemptive, saving way. Redemption was never offered to them. They desire to look into these things. They don't have any experiential knowledge of being rescued from hell. You and I do. And God says, as imperfect as you still are, you are my witnesses. God says, I'm going to use imperfection to get something done around here. And when something amazing happens, I'll get the glory. You say, Lord, use me. Here I am. Use me. Broken, frail, <laughs> error prone, but use me. Because I love you, Lord. Because you love me first. And we really owe him everything, don't we? Is there any price too high for you to pay, for you to offer to Jesus? Is there any sacrifice you wouldn't offer to Jesus? He poured out himself unto death for all of us. And the promise of salvation is, uh, is in, unspeakably great. And he doesn't just wipe away your sin debt, friends. He doesn't just say, well, now you're innocent because you believe me. This is the most remarkable thing I've ever heard in my entire life. He doesn't just empty your cup of guilt. Here you go, empty, now you're innocent. He says, I'm going to impute my righteousness to your account. God in Christ has regarded the lowly state of man, and he came into this world and reconciled the world to his Father. He made us savable. And those who have appropriated the saving benefits of what Jesus Christ did will never be the same. We're not the same. And the best is yet to come. The Bible says we are to consider him, we're to look to him, and the Bible says, friends, in 2 Corinthians 3.17 and following, that you are beholding the glory of the Lord as in a mirror. And you know from Hebrews 1 that the glory of the Lord is a person, and he's Jesus. Jesus Christ is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his person. And Paul says, you are beholding that glory as in a mirror, and guess what happens? You are being transformed into the same image. That is the end of our salvation, by the way, to be like Jesus. What's this all about? It's about God creating a new heavens and a new earth, absolutely filled with image bearers of his beloved Son. Glorified, sin-free, God-honoring and God-glorifying. Redeemed sinners who love God with everything they have. And we are going to be part of that number one day. But the work is already happening. The more you behold Jesus in the scriptures, the more you are made into his likeness. Hebrews 12 says you're to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, and you're to consider Jesus. Consider Jesus, that means think about him. Consider Jesus, the one who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Hey, at long last, we finally rediscovered the cure, the antidote for weariness and discouragement. It's to consider Jesus Christ seriously and to consult him. Friends, he is the one who has the answer to every one of our problems. 
big or small, the Son of God incarnate. And he is the one that makes us strong in him. In him, dear friends. Uh, Friends, I don't have any more to teach you this morning. I'd just like to close us with a prayer of gratitude. Maybe you can unite your heart with mine right now and we'll come to this great God. Dear blessed holy God, we come before you today, this morning, into your holy place through a torn veil. We thank you, Lord God, that you regarded the lowly state of man, those who were double disasters. We had sin natures and sin debts, and we were powerless to do anything about either one. But in the fullness of time, the Son of God came into the world incarnate. He paid our sin debt in full, and he was risen from the dead for our justification. We thank you, Lord, that you divinely persuaded us to believe in you to the salvation of our souls, and you've given us new minds and new perspectives and new appetites and new priorities. And uh, Lord, we ask you to help all of us to walk strong now, not to deviate and not to be deceived, but to be courageous, faithful, consistent ambassadors for Christ, even in the last of days. We know, O Lord, that one day the trumpet will sound and you'll call all your ambassadors home to their country, in heaven, and then you'll declare war on this planet. And Lord, while we're here in the days of grace, find us faithful. Find us about Father's business for his glory and the glory of his dear son and the glory of the gospel. May these things be so. May they be true of us. In Jesus' precious and beautiful name, we pray it all. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. And God bless you all, dear saints.